Now all to another one of Alan Robson's grisly tales. We're starting tonight with something that's downright grisly and disgusting. Sex crime. Now, there are a number of celebrities we've touched upon in previous weeks. People like Cosby and Mike Tyson, who've been jailed for rape. And we've also mentioned people who've appeared in TV shows like Deadwood. But we haven't mentioned some of the rock musicians like Ian Watkins, who founded a rock band in Wales called The Lost Prophet. An amazing band they were in their time. He was arrested in December 2012 for a whole batch of charges, including sexually assaulting children and possessing child pornography. The prophets broke up as soon as he was sentenced for 29 years in prison in 2013. And also, three years later, three detectives from the South Wales Police were also investigated for failing to act on people that had come forward charging Watkins with sexual abuse from as early as 2008. Now, if you're a fan of movies, especially American comedy films, you may have heard of Pee Wee Herman. He was a very, very distinctive looking guy and with his dicky bow tie and his skinny frame and his little grey suit played by a man called Paul Rubens and he's been playing Pee Wee since the 1980s however he was arrested in 1991 for indecent exposure which tarnished his especially Pee Wee Herman's public image because he was essentially an entertainer for children but then the police searched his house and found evidence of child pornography He made a plea agreement and pled for a a lesser sentence and he had to pay only $100 fine and attend counselling for a year. But he had to register as a sex offender during his time on probation. Obviously, most people know about Gary Glitter who put his computer in the shop to get it repaired. They found a whole load of child porn on it. He was arrested and subsequently has been rearrested, imprisoned, released, and he's now somewhere in South Asia, probably still doing the things that he does. Lawrence Taylor was a linebacker for New York Giants. If you're into American football, he won two Super Bowls and 10 Pro Bowls. And he was a, an infamous partier and a serious drug user, but he was sober in the 1990s to 2000s when he was arrested for the statutory rape of a 16-year-old girl. He pleaded guilty and he was sentenced to six years probation. But he is also registered as a low-risk level one sex offender. I know an awful lot of you are super keen on movies too, like I am. Horror films? Oh, I think so. Well, if you've watched the film Jeepers Creepers or any of the movies in that franchise, because there were a few of them, you will know an actor called Victor Salva. He was also in Clown House, if you're a, a bit of a purist. He was arrested in 1988 for sexual misconduct with a 12-year-old on the set of his debut movie, which was Clown House. After searching his house, they found videos and magazines loaded full of child porn. He was sentenced to three years in prison, serving 15 months of his sentence. He completed his parole in 1992, and even though he didn't make a movie for five years after his release, along came Jeepers Creepers and the creep was a star again. Now, like anybody of around my age, which is antique, but perfectly formed, KC and the Sunshine Band loved them, loved that band. Fabulous. Can't think of a song they did I didn't like. Sound that funky horn, queen of clubs, boogie shoes, please don't go. It goes on and on and on, and yet, One of their founding members, a guy called Richard Finch, who actually won Grammys 
for his work with KC and the Sunshine Man, and he also wrote the soundtrack for Saturday Night Fever, which is still being used. But in March 2010, Finch was accused of a sexual assault with a 17-year-old male. He admitted to it and confessed to having sexual contact with other people the same age, and he was sentenced to seven years in prison. In fact, he just got out March 2017, not that many years ago. That apparently was the way he liked it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think like everybody else, I was stunned when Rolf Harris, one of Britain's most beloved entertainers for decades, was arrested in 2013 as part of the post-Jimmy Savile crackdown on celebrity sex criminals. He had numerous allegations of historical offences, including allegations by a friend of his own daughter who claimed that he'd begun their relationship when she was underage. A letter even popped up from Harris to the girl's father where he begged forgiveness for scaring the girl and how he was in a state of abject self-loathing over the affair that Harris claimed only began after she was an adult. Anyway, he was found guilty of a whole range of assaults over the years and described by the prosecutor as a sinister pervert who had a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde character. The judge actually summed it up pretty well when he looked at Harris and said, your reputation now lies in ruins. And then he sentenced him to six years behind bars. Savile, everybody knows about Savile, hiding in plain sight, disgusting and disgraceful. And it opened the door on so many others. We know R. Kelly, Harvey Weinstein, a whole range of, of people with the finger firmly pointed towards them, and rightly so. Now, I must admit, I'd hoped that this feature would be quite short. However, no. Let's talk about Ron Jeremy, who is an adult film star, porn star, in fact, probably the most famous still on the planet. However, he was charged with raping three women and then was separately charged with raping a fourth and he was set to be prosecuted by the Deputy District Attorney Paul Thompson, who was also in the process of prosecuting Harvey Weinstein at the time. Jeremy has always said he was innocent on all counts. Danny Masterson, ever heard of him? He appeared uh, in a thing called The 70s Show in America, and the District Attorney announced that he was charged with raping three women between 2001 and 2003. Uh, he's been under investigation for sexual misconduct since 2016. They have declined to press charges against him in another two cases due to insufficient evidence. We know about Bill Cosby. He was found guilty of three counts of aggravated indecent assault. 10 years in prison. CeeLo Green, yeah. He was accused of sexually assaulting a woman who'd had dinner with in Los Angeles. They didn't have enough evidence to bring rape charges, but he was later charged with providing a controlled substance and putting it uh, in a drink. He pled not guilty. Now, the X-Men director, Brian Singer, how about him? He was accused of sexually abusing a male teenager. The accuser have filed additional lawsuits against other prominent members of the entertainment industry, but Singer was also charged with raping a 17-year-old boy in 2017. Sean Penn, he was charged with domestic violence with his then-wife Madonna tying her to a car. We've mentioned this in previous weeks. Brad Pitt, he was charged with indecent exposure in 1988 when he mooned drivers on the Pacific Coast Highway in California. Not the worst offence you could imagine. Roman Polanski, the director, every now and then you'll hear his name being mentioned. He was charged with statutory rape, sodomy and child molestation 
after he had what he called consensual sex with a 13-year-old girl. Now, most of the charges were dropped. Polanski pled guilty to statutory rape. The sentence was set to be probation. But when Polanski heard that the judge wanted to cause a media storm by giving this multi-multi-millionaire jail time, Polanski left Europe and fled to the United States. Then, Jim Morrison. We love Jim Morrison of the Doors, yet he's a sex offender too, whichever way you dress it up. In 1969, Jim was arrested for indecent exposure after performing a concert in Miami with the Doors. And uh, even on stage, he used to get it out and wave it about. He was later convicted, but avoided jail time by paying a $50,000 bond. Now... If we're talking sex crimes, we've got to list those that some people consider their absolute heroes. Oscar Wilde, one of Ireland's finest. He was convicted of sodomy and indecent acts in 1895, a time when homosexuality was common, in some schools almost expected, but he ended up spending two years in prison. I know a lot of people uh, mourn Tupac Shakur, some of his music very good, but he was charged with sexual assault and battery and sodomy in 1993. He admitted having consensual sex with the woman who accused him of the assault and he was convicted of first degree sexual abuse. So maybe not quite the guy that we thought he was. Now, he was born in Athens in Greece best known for two things, being the drummer of Motley Crue and also the man who did a sex tape with Pamela Anderson. Tommy Lee was charged with indecent exposure uh, when he dropped his pants while taking a bow at a 1990 Motley Crue concert. He was fined $1,647 for the incident. Nelly, oh, it's getting hot in here. Uh, the rapper was arrested in October 2017 when he was on tour in Washington. He was booked for second-degree rape following an encounter that took place allegedly on his tour bus. He was quickly released and tweeted to everybody that he was completely innocent. But he was booked for it. Like the peppers too, red or chili peppers, Anthony Caidis was charged with indecent exposure and sexual battery after a uh, Peppers concert in 1989, he paid a fine for indecent exposure, then appealed the sexual battery charge. Somebody that looks downright peculiar, but is, was in fact a bit of a mammy's boy, Marilyn Manson. He was charged with indecent exposure in 1994 and charged with sexual misconduct in 2001 by a male security officer. Apparently, the officer claimed, alleged, that he'd got it out, waved it about, and uh, offered to share it. The charges were late, uh, reduced to disorderly conduct, and Manson paid a fine of $4,000. Now, like most of the planets, when American wrestling first hit the screens, I was as interested in anybody else. We know it was made up, but it was fun. And one of those great professional wrestlers, back in 1993 was called Jerry Lawler. And he was charged with rape and sodomy of a 15-year-old girl. The charges were later dropped when the girl admitted that she had made up the whole story just to get in the newspapers. Green Day singer Billy Joe Armstrong, he was arrested for indecent exposure in 1996. And NFL player Jim Brown, he was charged with rape and sexual assault in 1985. The charges were later dropped. Woody Allen has long been suspected of having sexual relations with minors since as far back as 1992, and it has not affected his career in any way. Allen was found with nude photographs of his partner, Mia Farrow's 20-year-old adopted daughter, Sun Yi. Alan and Sun Yi were then married in 1997. And then in 2014, Alan's adopted daughter, Dylan Farrer, accused Alan of sexually assaulting him. John Travolta, can you believe it? Yeah, even him. In 2009, 
a cruise ship worker claimed that John Travolta sexually assaulted him. The bloke said that John Travolta exposed himself during a neck massage and later offered the man $12,000 to keep quiet. Travolta denies all allegations. I'm just telling you the names of people that have been charged, I'm not telling you whether they're right, wrong or indifferent. It's up to you to judge, really. Britney Spears is on the list, too. In 2012, Britney was accused of sexual harassment by her former bodyguard, Fernando Flores. He claimed that the pop star flashed at him and invited him into her bedroom while she was nude. Now, you see, if a man had done that, that's nasty and and icky. When a woman does that, everybody goes, "Mm, who wouldn't like that? Well, he didn't. He took exception to it, so there. Now, being somebody in the entertainment business, I hated all of that Operation U-Tree thing because it was an awful lot of radio people. Granted, pretty much 95% were BBC people, and a lot of them came from, like, poshy and rich schools, and led to people like Max Clifford, who was jailed for eight years for a string of indecent assaults against girls and young women. And we've already mentioned Jimmy Savile, and uh, Rolf Harris. And it seems as soon as some people became a celebrity, they got in with other celebrities that had similar proclivities. In fact, I was lucky enough to be invited to an awards ceremony at the Savoy in London to collect one of, uh, of the awards I was lucky enough to get. And the star guest was Robbie Williams. And this was round about the time that all this was going down. And Robbie's first words to the audience looking down at a room full of radio people was, Oh, you guys must be the ones that Operation U-Tree haven't caught yet. It was a joke, but blame me, three or four people from that room have subsequently been outed and arrested. But a lot of famous people. Now, if you were ever a fan of Glee, there's a guy there called Mark Salling. He was found to have over 50,000 images and hundreds of horrific videos of child pornography, including babies being raped. And they found that on his laptop and thumb drive. He was going to be made an example of, and it was likely he was going to get seven years in prison for all that they found, because some of the videos were just vile. However, he was found dead after reportedly having committed suicide by hanging himself just before the final sentencing took place. The world of rap has a whole list of people that have committed criminal offences of one sort or another, including the rapper Michael Taylor, who's better known as Mystical. He was in court in 2003 pleading guilty for sexual battery, and the charges against him were forcing his hairstylist to perform sexual acts on him as well as two of his bodyguards. He got a plea bargain and ended up getting a sentence of six years in prison and he was released in 2010 where he hasn't been a success since, quite rightly. Now, Strictly Come Dancing is massive in Britain. In America, they had a show called So You Think You Can Dance. Now, the star of that show was a guy by the name of Alex De Silva. The deputy district attorney at the time described him as a rapist disguised as a popular salsa instructor. During his trial, he admitted it all and was sentenced to 10 years behind bars for sex crimes. The choreographer was convicted for raping a 22-year-old woman and was also found guilty of assaulting a 25-year-old with the intent of raping her too. And the last one is an actor who, the face you will know, if not the name. There was a show on called Seventh Heaven, and this guy was the star, Stephen Collins. He's been in hundreds of movies and TV shows. This actor, who played a vicar and a loving father in the show, made the headlines for other reasons in 2014, being investigated of child molestation. 
he was caught on tape recorded by his own wife at the time admitting to molesting girls years ago. He later confessed to the People magazine that he did in fact engage in inappropriate sexual misconduct with three minors. That's not people that work down the pit, that's young female children in 1973, 1982 and 1994. I would have been quite happy to stop there, but it keeps going on. Cuba Gooding Jr. In August 2020, 30 women came forward with accusations of unwanted touching by Cuba Gooding Jr. and three counts of sex abuse to the third degree. The actor denied all wrongdoing. He pleaded not guilty. He says, we believe that the video will show Cuba committed absolutely no crime. We expect the case to be dismissed one day. Well, so many other people who are famous, names that you would know. Now, Donald Trump wanted Joe Biden, the man who's up against him for the presidency, because it was an open secret that Joe Biden had acted inappropriately. Uh, the way that he puts his arms around women, resting his hands on their shoulders, standing a little too close. I think that's kind of pushing it, especially in the lists of the sort of behaviour that we've shared with you today. Now, the singer-songwriter Ryan Adams, not Bry, Bry's cool, Ryan, he was apparently a, a predator when it came to women. Seven women, including Adam's ex-wife Mandy Moore, the singer, and a woman who was underage, claimed that he'd abused them psychologically and emotionally. Adam's lawyer said the allegations were serious and outlandish, made by disgruntled individuals. Adams also said, I'm not the perfect man, but I've never heard anybody intentionally or unintentionally. Well, who knows what the truth is. Kevin Spacey, an actor called Anthony Rapp, said that when he was 14 and a child actor, he was molested by Kevin Spacey, who was about 27 at the time. More men have come forward to say that Spacey assaulted them. Most accusations during his tenure as artistic director of the Old Vic in London. One described a full-fledged sexual relationship when he was only 14. One ex-employee said, We are all involved in keeping it quiet. I witnessed him groping men many times in all sorts of situations. Spacey has sought treatment. He was also fired from House of Cards and his charitable organisation, the Kevin Spacey Foundation, was closed. On September the 4th, 2018, the Los Angeles County District Attorney dismissed cases against Spacey and two other accused assailants, Stephen Seagal and actor Anthony Anderson. I was also really surprised that Morgan Freeman, blame me, he's even played God. Morgan Freeman has also got his name on the list. He was investigated after allegations from 16 people claiming that they witnessed or were victims of sexual harassment and inappropriate behaviour by Morgan Freeman. One woman who worked as a manager at Revelations, Freeman's production company, said that she was victim too. He said, if I ever passed him, he would stare at me in an awkward way, look me up and down, sometimes stopping and just staring. One time he stopped, looked me up and down as I walked into a room of people and everyone burst out laughing. I literally froze, feeling very uncomfortable. And one of the people in the office said, don't worry, that's just Morgan. In addition to a pattern of looking women up and down, which I think most men with red blood in their veins have done, or probably still do, CNN said that witnesses claimed to see Freeman subject female employees to unwanted touching and lewd comments. Allegedly, his behaviour was not limited to the offices where he ran, but also onto film sets and sometimes press parties, although nothing was ever proven. And I've got to mention George H.W. Bush. That's the dad. And uh, two women said that George H.W. Bush groped them 
During recent meetings with the former president, he touched me from behind from his wheelchair with his wife Barbara Bush by his side. He told me a dirty joke and then, all the while being photographed, he touched me again. And Bush didn't deny it. He said he's over 90. He apologised to his spokesperson for grabbing women's rears in what was intended to be a good-natured manner. In other words, if you're old enough, you can get away with pretty much anything. I briefly mentioned Steven Seagal, an actor that we've all watched his films at one time or another because he made so many. Multiple women accused him of sexual misconduct. One woman, Regina Simons, said Seagal raped her on the set of the film on Deadly Ground. Another woman, Faviola Dardis, said Seagal demanded that she audition for a role in a bikini and then groped her during the meeting when she was only 17. Other actresses, including Juliana Margulis, Catherine Heigl, Portia de Rossi and Jenny McCarthy, came forward with stories about Seagal's misconduct. Several former assistants also lodged complaints against him. But as we mentioned, all charges were dismissed. Dustin Hoffman, good grief. Uh, in 1985, Anna Graham Hunter was a 17-year-old production assistant working on death of a salesman. Dustin Hoffman played the title role and he made the experience really uncomfortable for her. It left her long-lasting scars. She said, he asked me to give him a foot massage my first day on set, so I did. He was openly flirtatious, he grabbed my ass, he talked about sex to me and in front of me, and one morning I went to his dressing room to take his breakfast order. He looked at me and grinned, taking his time. Then he said, I'll have a hard-boiled egg and a soft-boiled clitoris. His entourage burst out laughing. I left speechless. Then I went to the bathroom and cried. In December 2017, actress Catherine Rossiter wrote a column for the press sharing her own story of harassment by Hoffman. She said he groped her backstage, exposed her to the crew and demanded back and foot rubs. Two other women came forward to accuse Hoffman of sexual assault. Another woman said he exposed himself to her when she was a minor. And finally, I bet you're so glad to get out of this because this is icky. Star Trek fans, George Takai. Yes, Sulu. In November 2017, a former model, Scott Brunton, said that George Takai undressed and groped him in 1981 when he was 23. Takai in his 40s. Takai denied it though he had joked about grabbing men's crotches with Howard Stern in October of that year. All of these things are the charges made. You've got to make your own mind up what you think about each and every case. But in a world where there is so very little leeway these days, it's something to take seriously. But let's get down and grisly, shall we? Now, something that I always think is pretty grisly is contraceptive devices, okay? Now, I don't know about you, if you're a man, the very first time you ever had to put a condom on, and uh, did it go well? Didn't for me, ooh, not at all. Definitely a case of the wobbly warhead. And then, you women, having to try things like intrauterine devices, it, it's... Uh, getting an injection under your skin, but you've got to keep a hold of it and make sure it doesn't disappear. Putting something inside yourself that can also disappear. It, it's an icky, grisly kind of subject. However, I'm going to tell you a few stories of contraceptive devices right back from the beginning. At a time of ancient Rome and ancient Egypt, they made pessaries stuff you... Uh, place in the ladies <whistles> made from crocodile dung or goat's bladders to cover the bit where the egg tries to swim so that it either gets lost in the poo or bounces off the goat's bladder how about this in ancient china 16 tadpoles fried in quicksilver had to be swallowed quickly by the woman immediately after sex, otherwise she'd fall pregnant. It also had the side effect of killing a few of them too. 
Now, how about this? The Dominican Church in the 13th century. Now, this is the church we're talking about. They said that if you spit three times into the mouth of a frog, or if you eat bees immediately after sex, you'll not fall pregnant. That's the church. Now, in ancient Arabia, what they used to do was they used to mash up a pomegranate, mix it with rock, salt and alum, and then whoosh, up the lady before sex takes place. In Europe in the 16th century, they thought you could avoid having a baby by drinking raw onion juice. And a hundred years later, they thought if you ate cabbage immediately after sex, that would stop you having babies. None of these, of course, are true. Now, if you happen to be a Muslim, the holy book uh, of Islam in the 18th century said to avoid having a baby, jump backwards seven or nine times immediately after you have sex and you'll not have a baby. That's another holy book that wasn't telling the truth, just like the Dominican Bible didn't tell the truth earlier either. Also, in Europe in the 18th century, they made condoms from animal offal. It was usually sheep's intestines tied with a knot at the end, put over the man's willy, and they used that as a very, very early condom. The original condoms were made by slaughterhouse workers from sausage skins. The modern variety didn't become popular until Mr. Goodyear vulcanised his rubber in 1843. And, uh, like all good years, um, they're all right, as long as they don't blow out. And, of course, how many condoms can you make out of a car tyre? 365, if it's a good year. Ha! Right, let's move on. In Japan, men continue to wear condoms made from leather... And even some of them are made of tortoise shell, which you would think would knack the lady. Anyway, because he hated using condoms, the very famous lover and Lothario Casanova, he placed his faith in a technique where he inserted into his partner three gold balls that he bought from a Genoese goldsmith for 50 quid which was a fortune at the time. He said that this method had served him well for 15 years. A more likely explanation for his run of luck without any babies was the fact that he was actually infertile. And also, finally, in some third world countries, the use of Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola as a douche, in other words, when you're finished, lob some of this in, um, is one of the most common and successful forms of contraceptive. And uh, scientifically controlled tests at Harvard Medical School proved that although regular cola has a 91% success rate as a spermicide, Diet Coke, Diet Pepsi, is 100% effective. How about that? So, all you got to do is make sure that the Ladies Mary drinks a good glass of Diet Pepsi or Diet Coke and you should be all right. But don't sue me if that doesn't work out to be true. I'm merely quoting Harvard's figures here. Now, if you were to go on to Robson's World, there is a particularly cool show on there where I go to visit the cave of Sony Bean, the biggest mass murderer and serial killer ever in Britain, and also a cannibal. Now, I'm going to tell you his story now, and maybe you want to go and hear exactly what happened in an incredible journey to his caves. The word cannibalism comes from the Spanish name for a vicious tribe of man-eaters called the Caribs, based in the West Indies. They were known as the Cannibales. Although in many cases it was purely down to necessity, people during times of famine, even in Britain, selected a victim to guarantee their survival. In other tribal situations, it was believed that if you ate the heart of a brave man, you took on his courage. Well, perhaps Scotland would be considered one of the last places you would expect such a practice. Yet in the early 1500s, 
a man by the name of Alexander Bean, known as Sony, was born in East Lothian. He came from a very close family. His mam would make and sew clothes whilst dad trimmed hedges and would dig ditches for local farmers. Young Sony was particularly lazy, getting many a clip from his father for choosing idleness to hard graft, and over the course of a very warm summer, he met a woman with similar proclivities called Shona. Some say Sheila, others Sheena. But anyway, it was the love of a sort for the rest of their life. They found a cave in Benny and Head between Girvan and Ballantrae, its entrance hidden by the sea during high tide. And it was there, this couple, living in a cave, produced eight sons, six daughters, 18 grandsons and 14 granddaughters. Sons also had sex with their mother, their sisters and their children. It was an incestuous gathering of half-wits, bandits and thieves, and rather than work, they gained their wealth and food by stealing. Now, rather than leave a trail for soldiers to follow, they began dragging the dead bodies of the people they've robbed back into the cave. And rather than waste all of that fine meat, the bodies would be hacked into cuts. Some hung for a while to improve their flavour, other parts pickled, whilst the rest would be hurled off a hillside very near the sea. Month after month, parts of men, women and children were regularly being washed up on local shores. Now it's believed that the story of Nathaniel Crouch only ever happened because he had a fascination with Sony Bean. This man wrote stories under the pseudonym of Richard Burton and the stories were always about flesh eaters. As all around him, children, young women and the occasional handsome chap were disappearing. Now, the clue to who was responsible was quite easily sourced. Here is a chapter from one of his books. There was the thief in his den, with his wife and children all burned alive, they having made it their practice to kill young people and eat them. One girl of only 10 months was saved and brought up in Dundee. Then at 12, she was found guilty of killing a three-year-old boy and eating him alive. On standing before the magistrate, her plea made each who heard it shiver. Have I done such a heinous act? If you did but know how wonderful the taste of a man's flesh was, none of you would forbear to eat it. It's said to resemble the leanest of pork, without any fat, and if barbecued, you would never know it from the most delicious of meats. So, back to Sony, who had created almost a production line. Those dragged back to the cave, many alive, as meat eaten from anything freshly killed always tastes better. So the best way to keep the meat fresh was to hold the victims chained up to a number of shackles that they'd placed along the entrance chamber. Occasionally, young women would be captured. The males of this vile brood would rape them, saying that they were merely salting the meat. The women of the Bean Clan would also force male prisoners to sex, saying that they would set them free if they had sex with them. Yet they never did. As the months went on, the family, a weird-looking crew, the inbreeding had created the odd hunched back, others with deformed limbs or severe mental health issues. They grew in number, some say to 48, others up to 70. The elderly, when they died, were turned into a stew, and as a tribute to them, a party would be held where old grandma or grandpa would be totally consumed. Over a period of almost 24 years, the innkeepers of all of the hostelries within 30 miles of the Bean Cave suffered constant scrutiny. If someone had visited their inn or coaching house and they were never seen again, the finger of suspicion would fall fully upon the landlord. The king on three occasions sent his emissaries to find out if the landlords were murdering their rich guests to keep their money, their jewels and finery. 
In 1533, 128 innkeepers were hanged outside their own establishments as a warning from the king that travellers had to be allowed to travel safely. All the while, Sonny Bean found this hilarious and had his boys steal a few of those corpses before they spoilt. It's thought that 700 people were murdered and eaten by the family over the years. 80 years later, a huge cache of human bones was found trapped beneath a cliff, jammed in by the beating waves of the sea. Parts of at least a hundred bodies, skulls, torsos, and all with marks on them, as if they had been professionally butchered. Others even had tooth marks on the bones. And yet, all of a sudden, they had gone. The king believed that his action had actually worked. He'd hanged the innkeeper responsible. The rest were merely collateral damage. The roads and avenues were now safe for his subjects. But some locals had seen Somni and his family load carts, dragging them off into the night. All in the vicinity celebrated the end of the people eaters. Bean never bothered the nearby villages and had warned them that if they ever spoke out, their children would be their next meal. Some weeks later, on the east coast, just north of Berwick, another cave, almost identical to their old one on the west coast, was found on an empty beach miles away from the nearest town or farmhouse. Once again, the tide hid the entrance of the cave it was only ever noticeable at low tide, and even then you needed to bend double to move into it, leaping over slippery soaking seaweed and algae covered rocks. The cave then moved up and manacles were attached close to the chamber entrance. Three huge flat stones were dragged along to be skinning and preparation tables for the human meat. And there, on an upper level, a big circular chamber with fires burning to provide this clan with surprising amounts of heat. In the centre, a trench where human torsos were buried in charcoal to be cooked like a hog roast at your local rugby club. There were other smaller fires where children could be rotated on a spit or smaller organs could be pan fried or stews made. Strangely enough, you know, to this day, eating human flesh is not a crime. And almost every part of our bodies, except the bone, can be consumed. To some, they favoured the eyes, the cheeks, lips, all of the meat from the arms, legs and torso. The genitals were an especially tasty thing if cooked in wine, especially those of a female. The insides, of course, all had delicacies, just like your local butcher. Would serve heart, kidneys, liver, that sort of thing. Some preferred tongue, or maybe ribs. Clag a bit of sauce on. Do you really know where they come from? The Bean family were once almost found out in their new home when a family travelling towards Edinburgh came down onto their little beach to picnic before the next leg of their journey. They were having a paddle in the shallows when they heard a strange noise and went off to investigate. When they got there, they found over a thousand crabs of every size, from that of a coin up to the size of a shovel head, picking bones clean in a rock pool that was actually full of them. Some had a little flesh on them, and these creatures were picking them clean. Luckily, the father said, Look, children, these crabs have found the carcass of some poor creature, and they're in a feeding frenzy. Well, they dined on the other side of the beach and travelled on, not having any clue that this had been their luckiest of days. If you'd like the rest of the Bean story, you can go to robsonsworld.com and they'll all pour out for you there. And let's have a little bit of magic with the story of a witch queen and her boggles. Now, literally within walking distance of Lowther Castle, 
which is just on the verge of Cumbria, stands the tiny quaint little village of Ascom. Yet in the late 1600s, it was the stamping ground of a lady unknown to all except those who sought the craft. In black magic circles, Leonora was also known as the Dark Queen. and She was from a druidic background, yet she had left the druids to strike out alone. In her day, she was said to rule over 300 witches in her coven and it spread from North Wales right the way up to the Scottish borders. To all who knew her, she had genuine powers, certainly to hypnotise, she could create potions to heal or kill you, and the influence on those around her was great. She ordered that no one should write nor ever speak about her, and those who tried often met with savage treatment. Will Fleet was a local scribe in Cumbria and he decided to record all of the stories about her, both the good ones and the bad ones. And a local dignitary, believed to be a guest of the Lowthers, sat drinking with Fleet and was fascinated by all these stories he was regaling all about this colourful witch. So Fleet offered to take this man, a landowner from Chester, to meet this exotic woman. Leonora claimed to be from a long line of witches with a leaning towards the darker side that had gone back to long before the birth of what she called Christ the False Messiah. She was in her late thirties, yet she had this dark, intense beauty. And although many of the richer locals had courted her, she'd chosen a solitary life like most witches did. Yet the thing that set Leonora apart from all of the other witches, according to the Pagan Chronicles, was that she had her own legion of the damned. She could control the spirits of the dead and would use them against all who set themselves against her. So, when Fleet introduced her to this rich landowner, he mocked her even challenging her to demonstrate her so-called powers. Leonora was appalled, yet merely walked away, and the two men walked off saying, you see, just a charlatan, no power at all when you confront them. Yet later that night, as the men slept in rooms at a local tavern on the outskirts of Askham, there was a chill in the air. The landowner was drunk, and to wake up and see things being thrown across his room by invisible forces, he really thought he'd taken too much ale. Then he saw the outline of three men who came towards him and reached out to punch one, but his fist went through them. He began to shout out and panic, and the landlord and fleet were trying to get his bedroom door open without success, but the key even snapped off in the lock. Finally, all of the noise died down, and to their surprise, the door swung open to reveal the dead man's body. His face in full shock, his hair actually standing on end, and blood trickling out of his eyes, his nose, and out of both ears. The landlord ran off to get the local doctor, and just as he left, the door swung closed, trapping Fleet in the room. From every dark corner, black shapes appeared and surrounded him, whispering in his ear, pushing him, prodding him, and the scribe began screaming for help. Finally, the dark shapes backed away, and a tall, grey figure walked forward. Fleet was wide-eyed and he said, What do you want of me? The spirit was of a tall, bearded man with black dots for eyes, and he simply smiled before reaching into Fleet's chest and tearing out his soul. Fleet screamed even louder, seeing his own ghost staring back at him. Just then, he crumpled to the floor, and the very last thing he saw were those dark figures piling on top of him, squeezing all of the air from his lungs. This was how Leonora dealt with her enemies, or those who sought to humiliate her. She sent 
her boggles to deal with them. Two, the uneducated peasants living nearby, she was a wonderful, kind and caring person. She delivered all of the babies, she cured the sick, healed the lame, returned farm animals to full health, and she was a counsellor for all those who had any problem at all. She was genuinely loved by everyone, except the church. This led to a confrontation with the local abbot called Potts, who was staying for a while at Lowther Castle, having recently carried out a christening there. This rich and wealthy clergyman was enjoying the food, the drink, and the company of the well-to-do from the parish. It was then that he walked past a small cottage in the woods, and it was empty, but in there was an array of things hanging from leather cords. Dead birds, frogs, bunches of herbs, bottles half full of various odd liquids. Lord Lowther was asked what the strange building was, and he explained that seven years earlier, his seven-year-old son had fallen ill, and conventional medicine was not saving him, so he had sought help from the local witch. Lowther told the abbot that he had prayed to God to save his son without success, and the abbot said, well, God may want him, and if so, he will be taken. Well, Lowther scowled, for he wanted his son more than any divine being. The poor lad had eventually fallen into a coma, and whilst the entire family wept and felt so helpless, there was one glimpse of hope. One of his most trusted advisers told him about Leonora, this witch who had the power of healing. Now at this point, the child so close to death, the family would try anything. This all-powerful witch queen, who looked just like a normal woman, happily came up to the castle. Within 30 minutes of her ministering to him, the young boy was wide awake, still feverish, but now hungry and asking for soup. Within the week, he was running around as if nothing had ever been wrong with him. The local priest said it was the work of Satan, declaring if the church could not save him, he should have been left to die. So at this, Lord Lowther ordered the priest off his land and told him never to return. And he explained to the abbot, that little hut there is the witch house. And as long as my family rule this land, there will be provision and a welcome here for any friendly witch. We will happily feed her and she will always have a safe place to rest. This we do in acknowledgement for her saving the life of my son. To this day, there is a witch house on Lowther land. And if anyone not of pure heart stays in this house, they're pursued by boggles. They're followed home and beset by the black shadow creatures in punishment for their lack of respect. And thousands have seen boggles on Lowtherland. And that is our grisly tale or tales for today. Thank you again, I mean sincerely, for any help you can give me on robsonsworld.com we appreciate it it's just enough to keep everything running and i would be obliged of any help but until we are together again stay well stay safe and we will grizzle you again very very soon indeed from me alan robson god bless you and i wish you well